Hello, everyone. We're going to wait just a few more seconds for more people to join us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this Grow Native webinar, Wood from Trees Native to the Lower Midwest with Lynn Barnacle and Mike Hoffman. My name is Carol David. I'm the Executive Director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation and our 22-year-old Grow Native Native Plant Marketing and Education Program. We have 168 professional members of the Grow Native Program, including the sponsors that you see on the screen. We thank them for their support of our Grow Native Program in programming, including the webinar today, and for all of our other work to promote native plants. Please note that if you have questions for our presenters, you can write your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And when Lynn and Mike are done, I will come back on and read your questions to Lynn and Mike. And this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to all registrants as soon as possible after today. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Lynn Barnacle graduated from Jefferson City High School and served in the Army before receiving a Bachelor of Science degree in wood science from Colorado State University in Fort Collins. He worked at Louisiana Pacific Corporation in Alabama before becoming a field forester for the Missouri Department of Conservation in New Madrid and Ava. Later, he was the harvesting and watershed specialist, wood product specialist, and forestry state land program leader for the Missouri Department of Conservation working on statewide assignments from Jefferson City. Since 2010, he's been with Actually Wood Forestry and Woodworks LLC and Executive Director of the Missouri Consulting Foresters Association in Wardsville. Lynn has been married to his wife, Gail, since 1969 and has three children and nine grandchildren. Mike Hoffman received his, a Bachelor of Science degree in forest management from the University of Missouri in 1980 and worked 34 years as a forester for the Missouri Department of Conservation in Blue Springs, Piedmont, Branson, Sullivan, and Jefferson City. He retired in 2015 as the forest management chief and worked two years as the executive director of the Forest and Woodland Association of Missouri. Mike has always loved wood and woodworking and now has a hobby business making cutting boards, decorative boxes, wine glass caddies, beer and whiskey flights, cheese slicers, and various other wood items, which he and his wife sell at local farmer's markets. When not woodworking, Mike spends time fishing, hiking, playing with his four grandkids, gardening, and doing yard work. Thank you so much for presenting, and please take it away. Okay, um, I'm Lynn, so you recognize my voice, and we'll just kind of get started here. Uh, Carol asked me to just present a little bit about forest and woodland habitats. Um, wood comes from both. So a forest habitat, really basically trees are tall with considerably more clear stem than crown. Canopy is nearly closed and shades the ground. Woodland habitat conversely is noticeably short with um, more crown than clear stem. Canopy is typically more open so there's a more defined herbaceous layer. Now, it's important that landowners' management objectives and the land capabilities are both important influences when thinking about forest and woodland habitats. With that, welcome to the Lynn and Mike show about wood. Now, you folks already know a lot about wood. You cut wood, you burn wood, you may be woodworkers yourselves, and we want to build on what you know. So let's take a tour from outside the trees to the insides for a look at the wood. You're already familiar with what the tree looks like. There's conifers, they're like pine, short leaf pines are native, and deciduous trees like white oak and black walnut. Um, it bark, they all have branches. So we're familiar with those. They're fun to climb in. Uh, wood products come from trees like walnut dining table. It's one of my products, a hardwood floor and kitchen cabinets. Take a closer look at the inside of the tree though. It's where we'd like to go. So if you don't have a cook tree cookie, it's a good idea to get one. Simply get them from your wood pile. So um, starting from the outside of the tree here with the bark, that's the outer bark, it's two layers, the inner bark or the phloem, and phloem is conductive, the outer bark is more like our skin, it protects. 
The cambium is the growing layer of the tree and it makes phloem to the outside and xylem or wood to the inside. Xylem seems to be a biological term. I've never walked into a lumber yard asking for xylem, but I guess that's the way it goes. The next band is this band of sap wood. It's around, it's also conductive, living tissue. And so it's moving moisture and nutrients. Um, next layer in is the heartwood, which typically is a different color than the sapwood. Uh, heartwood has extractives, which help protect the wood from decay and maybe insect attack like Eastern red cedar, or black walnut or white oak. Um, the next point is the pith. It's the very bit biological center of the tree. So probably looking at these little marks here, they're indicating uh, growth rings. Uh, tree growth occurs in two stages. First, this time of year, the tree is making uh, a layer of wood called early wood or spring wood. And it goes till about July and then switches and does uh, late wood or summer wood. It's a little more dense, um, gives a wood strength and so forth. So um, probably the next thing you're noticing is this crack. You go, what in the world is that going on? So wood's kind of unique. It has properties in three different directions. There's longitudinally or down the length of a log or a length of a board. It shrinks, but it's really hard to measure because it doesn't shrink much at all. The tangential direction is kind of like a board cut from here. And the way I remember tangential is the fact I think of a tangerine, sounds like tangential, and it's sitting on a plate. And the growth rings are going in this manner. Radially, the growth rings go this direction. And it's called radial because of the wood rays that you don't see here, we'll get to that in a minute, radiate out from the pith all the way out to the end. But it's a radial direction. So shrinkage, this is where the crack comes in, is the fact that tangential shrinkage is twice radial direction shrinkage, which is this way. And that doesn't have anything to do with the thickness of these things. It's just the property of the wood itself. So the lip wood, when it dries, it shrinks, crack, and can actually pull itself apart. So uh, build on that a little bit. Here's a tangential board or face of a board that was flat sawed. You can see tangential shrinkage is about 11%. Radial is about 4.4. And the ratio is 2 to 2.5. So it's about twice, a little over. You can look at white oak, doesn't shrink quite as much. And uh, what shows up as a wood ray is a, in tiger stripe here in white oak. The wood ray here on this piece of flat sawed black oak would be a ray flag that looks like this. So the rays themselves are this structure. And they're also conductive when they're in the sapwood. This is white oak. Uh, it has rays as well. They radiate out from the center. And you notice here, um, white oak has a, in the white oak group has unique feature called tyloses that plugs the early wood pores. This is why barrels uh, or white oak barrels are able to hold wines, whiskeys, and other liquids. Red oak, on the other hand, the pores are not plugged and they would leak literally like a sieve. So um, we're going to take a trip, still going to the inside of the wood. You've seen quite a bit of there. And what I outlined are some of the ways that would help you identify different woods. My sources are the wood database. And uh, here's the website. Missouri Woods by Bob Massingale. So we'll take a look at some woods that are commonly found in Missouri and probably in your yard. Here's kind of the list of what we're gonna look at. And one other feature is wood is like a series of soda straws. That would be the uh, early wood pores and the late wood pores. Um, they conduct moisture and nutrients up through these structures. Woods also like cotton or wool. Wool is a natural fiber, both are, so is cotton. Cotton is, and wood have something similar, they're cellulose. Cellulose makes up about 60% of the volume of, of wood. 
short leaf pine. Let's take a, we're using the, essentially the 10 power hand lens. If you use one of those is what you're gonna look at. So here's the spring wood or early wood. And here's the late wood, summer wood portion. These dots are resin canals. And they're an identifying feature that help you separate out pines and spruce, Douglas fir and larch from other conifers. Those four are the ones that have resin canals. And this is what it looks like on a more flat sod surface. Uh, construction lumber is typically pine, spruce, and fir. It's very strong, it's lightweight, very strong when it's dry. It's cut the size in the mills and it's ready to nail. Conversely, a hardwood wouldn't be quite that way. If you ever tried to drive a nail in dry oak, you bend a lot of nails. Um, Eastern red cedar. Notice there are no resin canals. Uh, growth rings still. This is the sap wood or early wood. Here's the, the band of um, late wood. It's what it looks like on a flat sod surface here. It's very resinous. Uh, really has a nice aroma. You're probably familiar with Eastern red cedar or junipers virginiana. Mike made this box. It's functional. It has an aroma because it has Eastern red cedar on the inside. It's durable. It's hard. Uh, it's got some black walnut, some red oak in it. And the sides look like red oak also. So it's pretty handy. It's Pretty handy box, like for jewelry. Uh, Mike also made an Eastern Red Cedar pedestal table. It's glued strips of wood, comprise the top. It's functional, it's attractive, it's durable, and it also has good aroma. I can't take uh, credit for that, Lynn. That was Brian Swice built that. Brian Swice did that, okay. <laughs> now, I think this is at Mike's house here. It's actually at my daughter's cabin, yeah. All right, well, we're getting closer to you. Yeah. So again, Eastern red cedar in use. It's an Eastern red cedar is very durable because of the extractives in the heartwood. Now, Mike, you want to go ahead and talk about that a little bit? Got anything to add? Just, uh, you know, I had uh, cut a couple of red cedar trees out of my yard a few years ago and had always intended to make benches out of it. And my uh, oldest daughter built and her husband built a cabin up at Innsbruck and they were wanting a uh, kind of a fire pit area. So it wasn't my typical type of woodworking, but I used basically split a couple logs in half with my chainsaw and then did lots and lots of sanding <laughs> to get that smooth surface. Uh, I made some, uh, used some cedar for the, the uh, legs. Uh, screwed those on and, and uh, treated it with uh, uh, a water repellent. But, uh, you know, it looks beautiful in the picture there. It's it's already turned gray, so I'm going to have to refinish it to keep that that good color. But but the uh, like Lynn said, the uh, the heartwood and cedar has a lot of extractives and, and it's very rot resistant. So uh, the, the outside, the, the sapwood might kind of uh, rot away on those over time, but that uh, heartwood, that center is going to be there for a long time. Okay, he's definitely very inviting. Mike brought up a point about wood used outside typically turns gray, which is true. It's a, a natural reaction of wood and sunlight into the presence of air. It's an oxidation type reaction. Whoops, a little fast there. Uh, a real close look at red oak, and here are the pores that I was talking about. You see they're open. And again, here's a band of spring wood. It's what it looks like on a flat surface. Summer wood, the denser part would be this right in here. Much more dense than what this band is here, which is the spring wood. Uh, red oak is very common wood in Missouri. In fact, our forest is about what 80 something per se, 80 percent or better uh, oaks and hickory dominated by oaks. Uh, it's used in wood pallets, their platforms and facilitate shipping and display. You're familiar with them at Lowe's and other big box stores or grocery stores and railroad tracks. I think everybody's crossed a railroad at some point in time. So railroad ties and trains. 140,000 miles of freight railways in the U.S., 3,250 ties per mile 
The railroads report they replace over 16 million of ties annually. This is coming out of, of uh, Missouri Department of Transportation and the Railway Tie Association information. White oak, interesting wood here. The early wood bands, and you notice the pores are not open, they're plugged. Very difficult to get moisture through there. These are plugged as well. Here are the wood rays, a close up of what they look like. And this would be what the flat sod surface appears. Uh, White Oak in Missouri, Corcosaba is used in making whiskey and wine barrels. Um, and they're shipped worldwide, basically. Missouri is one of the bigger barrel producing states in the country. Um, shots from inside the stave mill. Mike's made up a, a very attractive way to display a bottle of wine and two wine glasses. It's uh, getting close to five, so obviously it's getting ready for Wednesday afternoon club. But strength, barrels are one of the strongest structures known, that double arch. Uh, it's durable, white oak is durable, it's stable because it's radially sawed staves and contributes flavor to spirits and wines. There's also a little bit of sustainability with that. Uh, the uh, Missouri oak barrels that are used for whiskey, they're just used once for, for bourbon uh, by law but then most of them are sold to either uh, wineries or distilleries in uh, Scotland to, uh, uh, they distill their, uh, their scotch and, and, and uh, their wine in used oak barrels. So they get many, many uses. Yeah, even a retired wine barrel gets used again. Yeah. Um, using it as a flavor component in some of the whiskeys. Interesting stuff, this wood. So Mike made some uh, sampling boards. Uh, the one on the left is, looks like red oak and walnut. And there's another form of it there on the right. It's functional, it's attractive presentations for a tasting board and it's durable as well. Black walnut, this black walnut looks like this. It is a little bit different pore structure and ring growth than the red oaks. This one is more called diffuse porous or maybe semi ring porous, which means it's difficult to see the change in the growth rings as you look across the cross section of the wood. You really, other than this color, you don't really notice when you've changed years in the life of the walnut. Here it kind of shows up because here's probably more of a early wood and this is more like late wood, but sometimes it's a little difficult to tell, particularly on something that's quite slow growing. Uh, Missouri is known as a leading black walnut producing state, home to custom gun stock manufacturers, strength, stability, and because walnut is just kind of normally stable. It, when it dries, it, it doesn't shrink quite like the red oaks. It has a great feel to it, plus it's attractive. Two different styles of stocks, the one on the right is one that I ref refinished for a fella, and and the one on the left is probably birch stained to look like walnut. Mike, do you want to tell us about your game room? It's another example of black walnut. Oh, this is another Brian Swice. Uh, another creation. Brian Swice. Okay. Yeah, he built that out of walnut and and uh, kind of a live edge walnut and uh, used it, uh, put in some lights, LED lights, and has it as a very decorative fixture. Yeah, and he's added these bow ties that go across what's probably was a crack one time. He's filled it, but it helps stabilize the crack. So it's an attractive feature. Warms the room, it's functional and attractive at the same, all at the same time. Black cherry, not necessarily the most common of Missouri woods, but it's there and you find it and it's pretty nice. Another example of diffuse porous wood, Fairly difficult to pick out the growth rings other than cherry is identifying feature would have one single row of pores that mark when the next, when the summer wood ends and the next layer of sap wood begins. So that's kind of a helpful identifying characteristic. It's what it looks like on a flat, sur flat sod surface. Cherry, uh, it's fun to turn. Uh, it's a bowl I made for my daughter 
it'll hold a whole bag of uh, on the border chips, big bag, and uh, segmented, it's in layers. Uh, there was a defect here that I did uh, turquoise inlay on, and it's just interesting wood to work with. So is the walnut. I, I can tell you my experience, uh, cherry is, is the most difficult to get consistent grain color and structure and you know, that cherry's the, the roughest wood I get as far as, you know, even buying what's considered number one common or FAS, uh, you find a lot of defect. And, and uh, I also notice on glue joints, I do a, most of my stuff's laminated, uh, different species. Whenever I have a glue joint fail, 90% of the time it involves cherry. So I don't know if there's something chemically in cherry that, that doesn't deal with the glue. I need to uh, do some research and figure that out. But it is yeah, it a beautiful be. wood and I love it. I love to use it. Yeah, same. It could be a grain orientation a little bit, might be playing into that. Possibly. Uh, my grow up a point, one thing unique about cherry is that it'll change color in sunlight. It doesn't necessarily turn gray like you know a piece of furniture in your house. It'll just turn darker over time. And again, it's an oxidation reaction and maybe a reaction to ultraviolet light as well. Um, a carved bowl, it's walnut, yeah, it's one I made for my daughter. Oh, wrong direction, sorry. Sugar maple. Um, it's another diffuse porous wood. It's very hard, it's one of the hardest woods we have. And uh, we don't have a lot of it. Missouri, Missouri's kind of unique. It's not really known as a sugar maple state, even though we have it, we seem to have a lot of it. And it's kind of like true for cherry. They're really good uh, black cherry and, and sugar maple come from the northeastern states and the north north states. And I just kind of a difference. We're sort of on the southern range, I guess, of these uh, species or maybe just not suited to our soil. So um, Mike, you want to tell us about you? I think you did make this now. I <laughs> get this one right. Yes, yes, that was <laughs> tell my us about idea. this. That was a passion project last year. I have a spot here in my basement that I've, I've always wanted a shuffleboard table and I just kind of took a bite out of it last winter and worked on it. Uh, the, uh, the actual bed itself, the plain surface is it started with two and a half inch thick uh, hard maple, sugar maple. Uh, it's uh, 20 feet, or I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's 13 feet long, uh, 20 inches wide and you know, sanded is about two and a quarter inches thick. And then I also uh, glued up and, and turned some maple, hard maple pins uh, to do, you know, the bowling game with the uh, shuffleboard pucks. So uh, we've used it quite a bit. The, the actual table the, the, uh, itself that the plane surface sits in is, is uh, built out of uh, oak, or at least it's all skinned in, in red oak. Uh, it, it was a, it was quite a job. It was about a two month process to get it done, but uh, I enjoyed it and now we get a lot of fun out of it. And that maple, you, you know, if you've ever used a shuffleboard puck, those things are, they're metal and they're pretty hard. They don't dent those uh, pins at all when you hit them. That maple's very hard and very resistant to uh, indents. Yeah, you see a lot of maple used in bowling alleys for both pins and uh, the lanes themselves. And basketball courts are typically sugar maple. So it's very definitely a hard wood. In fact, you also find it in baseball bats. Yep. Um, so characteristic wise, it's durable, but just because it's wood, but sugar maple is not durable out, but you wouldn't want it for a fence post, what I'm trying to say. It's shock resistant, but it's also attractive. So Mike's done some cutting boards. Tell us about them, Mike. Well, the, the one on the left is a, uh, it's an end grain cutting board. You know, when Lynn was talking about the tangential versus radial side, uh, you know, the end grain is gonna be uh, stronger and more resistant to cutting uh, than the side grain. Uh, so it'll hold up better as a cutting board. Um, you've, you've changed the slide there, Lynn. Oh, I did? Yep, or it is on oh, mine. Sorry, there we go, sorry. Yeah, there you go. Uh, this was a large cutting board. It was about 18 inches wide by uh, 
I think over 30 inches long. It was a kind of a special order. I don't know that I'll do one again because I had hours and hours in that thing. Uh, but it's a beautiful cutting board. It's a mixture of a lot of different species. The one on the right is, is really made as a charcuterie board. It's fairly large and, and I have the inset handle so you can actually, when you have your, your meat and cheeses or fruits or vegetables, whatever you put on it, you can pick it up and, and move it around. So those are some of the things I, I make that I sell at the farmer's markets. Yeah, Mike talked about the end grain on the, the board on the left. That's typically the way they would orient the grain on the old fashioned butcher blocks that were found in the butcher shops years ago. They still be there. Uh, but again, color, durability, warmth, it's functional, it's artistic, and strong. So it's, those are the characteristics of the wood. Um, Osage Orange. This one is interesting. We're going back to a ring porous wood like this. There's a definite band of early wood and a very definite band of late wood. It's called a feature like that. It's called ring porous. You see the rays and you see the, the pores plugged with tyloses both in the early wood and the late wood. It's what it looks like on the flat sod surface. Osage orange is kind of unique. It's one that over time will turn from this bright yellow to more of a brown. In other words, it'll go more this color that's showing up in the late wood. So that's kind of unique. It's very hard wood, very strong. It's been used in bows, believe it or not. Um, so here, I, I collaborate with my spouse on making spinning and weaving tools, which are part of her hobby. She, she does, we joke, I do wood, she does wool. They're only one letter apart. Um, they're both fiber. So Osage Orange are in these little forks. These are cherry, and here's cherry, walnut, and sugar maple. But those are forks like for what a, a weaver would use in a tapestry loom. Uh, yellow poplar uh, is a diffused porous wood. You don't see a real definite change in the across the growth rings. It's a softer wood. It's fairly stable. It's not durable. You wouldn't want it for a fence post. And fairly strong. It's used in trims inside houses. Um, I've used them in making drop spindles, which is a very old-fashioned way of spinning. Uh, yarns, either wool or cotton or, or other fiber. Uh, that's due to the weight of them, but they're basically functioning like a top. And uh, the drop spindle spins, and in this particular one here, the yarn would wind up around this part of the shaft, try to make them decorative. But yellow poplar is a, a good one if you're trying to control the weight. Uh, I mean, some people have ordered drop spindles that they just want them to be a few grams in weight, if not. Uh, less than, than a gram. It gets kind of tricky and, and uh, I ended up using some box elder one time because it uh, was just that uh, very light wood. Knitting needles. Uh, here we, this one is more than likely Osage orange that, that change color. As I am picking up on some growth rings in here. These are yellow poplar and these are walnut. They're, um, fairly large diameter. I mark this one as a uh, number 20, which is just under a, probably under an inch in diameter at this part. And this one looks like a 25, which is right at an inch. And these are something smaller. Uh, wood's good. You can't beat it. Strength. Uh, wood frame of your home supports heavy snow and resists strong winds. Uh, stability. Wood can change shape in this environment. Uh, woods, are, some woods are more resistant to changes in humidity, like older houses that didn't have, before we all had air conditioning, doors would warp and drawers would stick in the summertime because the wood is says, swollen up with gaining moisture. It comes to equilibrium with its environment depending on what the relative humidity on the outside is. Wood can be shock resistant and repeated use like baseball bats handles for hammers and axes. Um, there's an aroma and durability, aromatic red cedar closet lining of the spicy aroma of sassafras are both resistant to insect and fungi. Uh, that's why red cedar is frequently used in closet, closet lining or fence posts. Color, light to dark and shades between. You get a variation from sugar maple to cherry to walnut and in between. Flavor, 
The organic components of white oak lend flavors similar to vanilla in spirits and wines. Comes from the lignin layer that's the actual substance that plugs the, the pores of the white oak. Uh, smoke from the toasting process also contributes flavors to, to uh, whiskeys and, and, or spirits and, and wines. Warmth. Wood is a natural, comfortable, contrasting sensation in dark rooms of light colored tile, paint, and plastic computer gear. Gives you a good feeling. Feel. As you prepare meals, your favorite cooking utensils feel good in your hand. It's what my spouse tells me about utensils I make for her in the kitchen as well as her um, fabric uh, tools. It's functional as well as artistic. We talked about cutting boards and charcuteries, bowls, pizza peels, and other items. It's natural and sustainable. Trees and forests are natural, provide environmental services like clean air and water, soil protection, carbon storage, wildlife habitat. It's renewable and sustainable when managed correctly. Uh, Missouri is a home to two MLB teams, the Cards and the Royals. Uh, West Missouri owners do grow some ash and sugar maple. However, ball bat manufacturing is done elsewhere. It's an example of a wood grown here that's shipped out. The take home point about a wood bat is that it must be straight grain, strong and shock resistant. Um, through some bad experiences with, with MLB teams, broken bats, um, very serious accident occurred to a fan when a shard flew off the playing field and struck somebody. And not good. It led to a research project at the Forest Products Lab, run by the Forest Service, where scientists studied bats and tested them in bending testing and determined that if you have a, a slope of grain in excess of 3%, that would be an indicator of this. A straight, very straight grain is required in both sugar maple and in ash. Sad part about ash is the emerald ash borer is probably going to be the end of use of ash bats, more than likely. Some other ones may be used, but sugar maple seems to be one of choice. Um, Mike, well, tell us about your features here, drawer and a, a, a recipe stand. Well, you were talking about uh, ash. I, I typically use ash for, for my drawers when I build furniture. I don't like building furniture <laughs> because it just takes a lot of time. But uh, the ash is, is, is very easy to work, uh, very dimensionally stable, uh, and, and really does a good job for, for making drawers and things like that. Uh, I make some uh, iPad or tablet holders. Uh, and again, I use a mixture of wood. I, I think I've I think that one actually is is cherry, maple, and walnut. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I I I use a lot of mixtures of woods if I'm not looking for a specific quality. But like in a drawer, obviously I'm looking for stability and and uh, strength, and that's why I go with the ash on that. So red elm is another uh, kind of common. Wood in Missouri, there's several different elms. Uh, this is ring porous, early wood versus a late wood. Uh, this is not plugged with tyloses, as appears to. So the wavy bands of parenchyma cells. You go to college to learn that word about parenchyma. That's this stuff out here, these pores. There are in wavy bands, and this is what it looks like on a flat sawed wood surface these marks here, and it does. It gives a wavy appearance. It's kind of pretty wood. Uh, it doesn't get the press that red oak or white oak does, but it's, it's interesting wood to work with and just unique. So some examples of some of my work, I've done some furniture, but a lot of times I do things like this, a pizza peel, a charcuterie, uh, these are pot pie makers. They were very popular during the pandemic. They're lathe turn, laminated lathe turn. Utensils and bowls. This one happens to be sycamore, uh, sugar, probably uh, that's beech and walnut. Um, this came from Brian Swice of all things. I made the bowl, but he provided the burl. He, he also has one. Uh, a guitar charcuterie or a fish charcuterie and just can be geometric, but it's wood in the kitchen. Uh, 
Uh, some other examples of things I've made, uh, walnut table, a king bed frame, and a book tree that was done for a, for a, gentle, for a family, for a granddaughter. Uh, this is unique. This is uh, a bench, and I don't know why I did that, but it did. There we go. Um, this is unique in that this wood is uh, ponderosa pine that was killed by beetles and then a blue stain. And ponderosa pine, not necessarily durable in the sense of using it like uh, in a fence post, but if you can catch it early enough, soon after it dies, you can salvage lumber out of it. And this is kind of what you get. It's unique looking wood. Uh, the blue stain is a non-wood destroying fungi, but if the conditions are okay for a blue stain to occur within a tree or the wood, then chances are the wood destroying fungi are there as well. And I did have to work around a little bit of rot in, the, in these boards and putting this edge glue in this table and, and bench. These are all edge glued and a lot of fun to do. It's, it's exciting to watch somebody's face light up when you actually finish a project and present it to them. Uh, more fiber art things. We've seen some of this. Um, this is a tapestry loom here. A swift, which is used to make a and measure a skein of yarn that wraps around pins. This is on a lazy Susan bearing. And these are handheld tapestry looms. They're great for traveling. Uh, my spouse does wool painting or felted painting. And this is one of her works of art that I put a frame around. So, and really, let's, Mike, you got something else to add? And feel free to do so, but basically we're done and ready for questions. Thank you very much. Mike, did you have anything else to add? Uh, no, uh, you know, Lynn at the beginning talked about, uh, you know, forest versus woodland. Uh, you know, there's trees have so many different qualities, uh, good qualities that uh, they help in the environment. You know, the wood is just one piece of it. Uh, and, and wood is, the character of wood is actually impacted by how the tree grows. You know, something that's grown in a more open woodland is going to be limier. It's going to have more knots, uh, maybe faster growing. Uh, so it's going to have differences in the grain. Uh, and, and all those things are good for certain uses of the wood. So, you know, we like to see all of those. Uh, we like to see a lot of different types of woods. You know, we're, we're always looking for different character, you know, bird's eye maple, uh, those types of things are in, in the burl that Lynn showed. Uh, those are actually from defects in the tree, uh, but they're actually add a lot of character to the wood and uh, add a lot of beauty to whatever we're using it for. So, uh, you know, we, we enjoy the forest. We're both foresters and, and uh, we enjoy the wood that comes from, from them, along with all the other great benefits we get from the, the forest and the trees. Thank you. Yes, with the Grow Native program, we um, are very often touting the uh, ecological services of trees and how they are important host uh, plants for so many insects that you know, are foundational to the nature's web of life. Um, but of course, the wood of trees is very uh, useful for people. We do have a number of questions. Um, Richard asks, were the wood items shown on your slides made from lumber yard stock or harvested directly from private forests? Um, all of the above. <laughs> yeah, all of the above, yeah. I, I buy mostly uh, uh, lumber uh, from a lumber yard. Uh, that in Missouri, I use pretty much all Missouri born, Missouri grown woods and harvested woods, uh, and they're all kill dried, which really helps a lot with the shrinkage Lynn was talking about. They're a lot more stable for making things. Uh, but some of the stuff you saw on there was was live edge that that came from other sources. I know Lynn uses a lot of other sources as well. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a place where I deer hunt has a. Um, um, 390 acres, most of which is in timber. And 
you know, you get trees die that are easy to get to. I know we've salvaged a, a dead white oak and a walnut that had been, I'll say root sprung because the wind kind of tipped it over a little bit. The same with a hackberry. And we were able to, to uh, use a, the landowner's tractor and trailer and hauled uh, logs we salvaged up to us. Uh, a gentleman up at the Columbia Airport has a band mill and a solar dry kill. So that's one way I get wood, but I do source like Mike from lumber yards. Well, one of the issues of, of, of using wood just sourced out of a tree that died in a yard or, or you know, finding something uh, is, is really getting it dried and stabilized. And, and I just don't have the space to be able to you know, stack and dry wood for a long period of time to get it to the point where I can use it. So, you know, for some specific functions. Uh, you know, Lynn makes a lot of wood utensils. One of the guys that, that goes to a lot of the farmer markets, farmers markets that I go to, uh, makes exclusively wood utensils and he uses green wood to make those. And so, you know, he doesn't buy any lumber. He just, he just buys, he gets wood from wherever he can uh, out of people's yards or wherever from, from down trees and, and he'll use that. So it really depends on what you're going to use it for is in terms of where you would source it from. Yeah, sometimes you can salvage a log that uh, that came out of a yard that's but it's got moisture in it, and I can I can turn a bowl in a green stage. It's a lot of fun to turn green wood because it turns nicely, but you still have to lay it back and let it protect it and let it dry for a while. Sometimes up to a year or so. But anyway, that's kind of how we respond. What what else you got for us, Carol? A couple questions about um, kind of safety with, when using wood for, for bowls or eating implements. One question, I've heard that some trees like black cherry are toxic. Which trees cannot be used for eating implements? Uh, where I have heard about black cherry being toxic is the leaves that cattle might be able to get a hold of. And other than that, I'm not, you wanna be careful about the sawdust that comes off making a wood product. Uh, if you breathe it, you can have some lung problems. So I'm typically wearing a dust mask and face protection that kind of helps fend off the dust and also um, has some air, I don't want to say purifying equipment, but I have a dust collector and, a, and an air filter in my shop that really helps an attempt to keep the dust down. But it, it is something to pay attention to. Um, the finishes on the wood, uh, you can get food safe finishes. Uh, beeswax mineral oil is an example. Beeswax, a natural product from bees, and mineral oil you can get out of your pharmacy that is food safe. Uh, it's not a long lasting finish, it needs to be restored, but you can mix the two. And uh, there's also some uh, cutting board oils. Uh, Watco makes one, so does General, uh, that are built out as being food safe. <laughs> smell like polyurethane varnish, but after a period of time, um, the cutting board oils are uh, determined as, as safe for food, say, I think it's after 72 hours. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'm not aware of any wood being, having a specific, at least not any native Missouri wood having a specific toxicity just by touching the wood. Um, and actually, there's some studies out of the uh, University of California, Davis, uh, where they actually found uh, bacteria does not grow, uh, does not survive on wood cutting boards as much as it does on plastic ones. So, so they are, uh, you know, wood can be a very safe uh, material to use for, for cutting boards and for utensils. And, and again, they have to be treated correctly. Thank you. Uh, it was a question, kind of a, a question from Jacob and then a follow-up one, and I'm gonna present both of them to you. He asks, what makes logging and timber operations sustainable versus non-sustainable? And he also asks, where are the most ecologically healthy timberlands in Missouri? Um, I think it goes to landowner objectives. Uh, Missouri is kind of unique in hardwoods. Um, for instance, if you go harvest in an oak forest, you, in the Ozarks anyway, you typically get oaks back. Um, probably one of the examples of something that got 
exploited a lot short leaf pine. So back the late 1800s, early 1900s was that very large cut where harvest in the Ozarks where the short leaf was targeted. And basically uh, due to non-management and land use change like forest land to farms uh, or crops and we end up losing a lot of acreage of short leaf pine. Um, so I think, it, you know, logging done with following a management plan is key. There are definite prescriptions that foresters recommend to private owners. Consultants can do this. So does the uh, conservation department foresters as well as uh, forest service foresters and foresters that work for the National Resource Conservation Service. They're all familiar with these prescriptions that we can use. And it's based on inventory of the forest and capabilities of the land and the landowner objectives. Uh, I think sometimes folks get, uh, you know, they want to blame clear cutting for things, but, um, and granted clear cuts don't necessarily look all that great, but the real question is, is going to come back to forest or is it going to be a land use change and go to parking lots and buildings or grassland? Obviously, those would not necessarily be sustainable. Yeah, well, trees. Want to add? The trees are a living organism like anything else, and, and they have a lifespan, a short, especially here in the Midwest. You know, white oak can potentially live a couple hundred years, but most species are going to live a hundred or less years. And as they grow and senesce and die, uh, you know, you have to manage that forest to replace them with whatever species you want for whatever management objectives you have, like Lynn was talking about. Are you interested in wildlife? So you're going to look for certain species there, depending on the type of wildlife. Are you interested in timber? Are you interested in uh, just having it look pretty? Uh, so, yes, it's definitely sustainable. Trees, uh, once they're harvested, they'll grow back or oaks. They call it coppice reproduction. You know, they'll, most of our hardwoods in Missouri will actually sprout back from the stump uh, and, and grow very quickly. Uh, you do have to create openings in the canopy because most of our trees are, are somewhat intolerant of shade. And for them, for younger trees to get established, you have to get that sunlight to the ground. So you can create openings by taking up individual trees or by doing some thinning. Uh, and leaving the better stems or the trees that, that are going to provide the benefits you're looking for. Uh, but yes, it, you know, a forest will grow and live and die. And, it, and as it gets to be very old, uh, then, you, you know, you get a closed canopy, you get very little sunlight underneath, so it really restricts a herbaceous growth. Uh, and the trees start to senesce and die. They're, they're not storing the carbon that a young, healthy growing forest will store. Uh, so, so a managed forest is a healthy forest. And again, a lot of the things you see when trees are cut, that's not necessarily forest management. It, it has to be done, like Lynn said, with, with a view towards the long-term objectives and typically uh, under the advice of, of a forester or somebody who is aware of how they can, how they can help meet those objectives. Thank you. Uh, now there's a question from Steve about a term that you used. Um, what do you mean by live edge? I don't remember you using that term. Yes, live edge is, is just where you have a uh, basically a piece of lumber that has the bark attached on one end or both on or both sides. They call that life ed live edge. Uh, you see that being used quite a bit now. Uh, for a lot of things you see a lot of coffee tables and things like that that are live edge you should be able to google that word and you'll see all kinds of pictures of of live edge uh, furniture <laughs> thank you a uh, question from rosalie and what farmers markets do you sell your beautiful products <laughs> Well, I right now I'm I'm down and out with the torn meniscus, so I'm I'm not able to get <laughs> move around and get my stuff set up. But but typically I'm in the St. Louis area, uh, Pacific. I, I typically go to the Wildwood Farmers Market, uh, sometimes to uh, Arnold, 
uh, up to uh, Defiance Ridge Winery or Noblest Winery. Uh, I've gone to several different ones, but my mainstay, oh, Union has one as well I've been to, but my mainstay has been the Wildwood Farmers Market. And I know Lynn does a lot of uh, online sell, Etsy selling, don't you? Yeah, we used to we used to do some shows, craft shows in St. Louis. It's just got to be a lot of work going from loading up the truck and going to St. Louis. And uh, my knees don't like crawling around the back of the truck anymore. Um, Rolling Ridge Nursery in Webster Groves is a show we used to do. It's right right though right kind of before Thanksgiving, but it's it's got some woodworkers there. And there were some other shows around. If you Google craft shows, St. Louis, and probably get covered up with them. Same would be true in about any town. Um, a lot of small towns have craft shows. Uh, we used to do a show up uh, by laws in a little place. Uh, but right now, my, my spouse, Gail, and I are both at the Art Bazaar in Jefferson City. And we do an Etsy shop called Turn Up Green. And uh, but those, those are options for us now. Thank you. And you can, almost every farmer's market I've been to, there's usually multiple people that have uh, handmade wood items, you know, if you're looking for that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, some better than others, but, but uh, you can typically find them around. And like Lynn said, just find a farmer's market nearby. Thank you. We have three more questions. Steve asks, if anyone is harvesting black locust, or the scientific name would, would be Rubinia pseudo, pseudo acacia. It is a replacement for tropical hardwoods. It's selling for $10. He says BF, I'm assuming that means board foot plus shipping from Georgia or Wisconsin. So is anybody harvesting black locust in M Missouri or the lower Midwest? It's, uh, it is a native tree, um, but the only place I've ever run across it that had a market was here in Jeff City at Cardwell Lumber. Um, they, their sawmills up in Novelty, Missouri, along with their dry kill, and I actually source some black walnut or excuse me, black locust for them from them one time. Um, hard to find. You don't see a lot of it out uh, at all. As probably one reason the price is pretty high. Uh, I don't remember what I paid for it, but it was not that much. Uh, it's a specialty wood, and yes, it is very hard. Uh, years ago, it was used for the wood fixtures that glass insulators were screwed to on like telegraph and electric lines that followed along railroad tracks and other, other utilities as well. But it was the pins that those glass insulators sat on. It was kind of the only use I've ever heard for it. Um, well, back, yeah, in the, back in the... 70s during the energy crises, there was a lot of work on on doing firewood plantations, uh, firewood for heat and black locust is fast growing. It's it's a lot of BTUs per pound. It's a very dense wood uh, and it black uh, locust, uh, green ash, you know, some faster growing species were used for that. Uh, you don't see much of that anymore. Uh, but yeah, I've never personally used any black locust for anything I've done. It's interesting wood. It has a, a structure much like Osage orange, but it's not the bright yellow. Uh, it's more of a, a lighter brown. And if you really, in wood ID class, if you really got confused about which was which, one of the tricks for identifying Osage orange is to wet your finger with some spit and rub it on the Osage orange and then take a piece of paper and see if it turns yellow. That's a pretty good trick of the trade for identifying old sage orange. That's why in Wood ID, we called it spit and whittle class because we are forever carving on a piece of wood, looking at the end grain. And if you make it wet a little bit, it, the grain pops some and you can, you can see it easier. You can see the pores easier, but you need a really sharp knife also and a 10 power hand lens. Steve mentions that it's also highly rot resistant. And I think his point was yes. that it can be used for deck decks and, and, you know, if it can be harvested here, it could be more sustainable than harvesting a tropical hardwood. Um, two more questions. Carrie says, my dad harvested and planked a lot of walnut for projects over the years, but it's been hanging out in a hay 
maybe hay barn for the last decade since his mobility prevented him from working with it. He since passed, but we'd like to use it even though it's likely heat split. Anything else we should be aware of when we pull it out in terms of working with it? I, if it's only 10 years, I don't think it's going to be brash, which means it can crack across the grain. But um, it, when you say heat split, that's going to be kind of a normal thing during the drying process. Remember back on the tree cookie, how the wood pulls itself apart because of the shrinkage in different directions, radial and tangential. That's what's going on in a board. The same thing. And it can be in the, in the barn. It'll get warm enough in the summer to accelerate drying. And that tends to make the crack show up a little more. Um, what It's never seen a dry kiln. What I've noticed about wood like that is it's probably going to have a very beautiful shade of not necessarily chocolate, but it may have more of a purple cast to the walnut than a, than a black or a, a, a deep chart, dark chocolate color that you get from wood coming out of a dry kill. And it may process really nicely. Um, in fact, right now I'm working with some uh, uh, gentlemen on making some uh, cutting boards, maybe charcuteries, that are in the shape of the state of Nebraska and the wood came off their family farm back, I'm not sure when it was cut, but it's been a long time. And it's it's fun to work with it. Um, it's, yeah, I'd encourage you to have fun. And I don't think there's anything else to be aware of. You definitely need to get it planed. Um, one thing to think about is bring it into your house and the relative humidity in your house is probably lower than what's going to be in that barn and let it sit there for a little bit and just come to equilibrium with uh, the, you know the house relative humidity and it'll be a little bit different in the summer than the winter uh, a little more humid in the summer and the first is running in the winter and tends to dry things out a little bit more uh, but you should be able to get down around 10 percent moisture content and it should behave fairly well um, in fact, we, if I buy lumber, same with Mike, we buy lumber from a, a, a hardwood lumber yard. It may be dried down to six to 8% coming out of the dry kiln, but that wood is adjusted to whatever environment it's in, in the, in the, the covered space within the lumber yard. But also once it gets in my house, it's going to adjust to that. And I, the time-wise, probably I'm, I'm guessing here a little bit, maybe a couple of weeks for that adjustment to take place and maybe a little less also. One last question. Are there any associations, books, or other resources you would recommend for learning about woodworking and wood products? And uh, as you mentioned these, I'll write them down and I'll try to include as many of them as we can in the email that goes out to everybody with a link to a recording of this webinar. Yeah, that wood database is really good for showing you pictures of wood. Uh, so is Bob Manson, Robert Massengale's book, Missouri Woods. Um, Bruce Hoadley has a series also that, that are, it's, uh, I don't think it's online, but you can, it's hard copy, hardback books about woodworking, wood identification. Um, I think if you could find a key to identifying wood, um, one textbook, I think is a Springer, Springer, I don't recall the guy's name, I can look it up, that I think has a key in it, and the old, the one I used was uh, Textbook of Wood Technology, Volume 1, has a key in it that works pretty well, it's written for people using 10 power hand lenses, and doesn't go into the microscopic uh, ways to look at wood through a microscope. But those would be sources. Those are ones I'm familiar with, anyway. Uh, well, and if 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 he's specifically looking for information about woodworking itself, uh, you know there are there are groups around, particularly for wood turners. Uh, there there's several really good wood turners groups. Uh, I have a lathe. I've messed with it a little bit, but but uh, to really get to where I need to be, I need to join one of those groups. But what I found is you can go on YouTube and find videos of all kinds of woodworking processes. The thing is, there's so many different ways of, you know, joinery for doing 
building cabinets or, or whatever you want to do, uh, a lot of that's your personal preference. Uh, but, you know, I just kind of learned it school of hard knocks. I bought tools and just started experimenting and messing with stuff. And, and uh, that's kind of how I learned to do the woodworking. I've always had a, always had a uh, passion for doing it. Uh, but but there's there's lots of resources. I'm I'm not joined any specific group woodworking group, but uh, uh, the uh, popular woodworking magazine they have a, they have uh, some online videos and things you can subscribe to. Uh, there there's a lot of places you can get information on woodworking itself. Thank you. Fine. As far as oh go ahead, were you going to add something, Lynn? Yeah, look for fine woodworking. Uh, there's a series of books out there, but I think they still do a magazine. And the American Association of Wood Turners is a, an example of a, uh, basically it's an international group uh, that is involved in turning. And they're they're these are guys that are in it in it for the art and in it for in commercial as well. Uh, but it's they're heavy to art. And they do a series of, uh, you know, they have meetings. There's actually groups in St. Louis that are, Mike said that, that are uh, member, have membership in that group as well. Um, I would also was going to add perhaps the um, Forest Products Association, which is, I suppose, more on the commercial side of thing, industry side of things, but people might still find that interesting. And then there's also for forest and woodland landowners, there the, there's the Forest and Woodland Association that Lynn and, and Mike are both involved with. If any of anyone on the call or on the webinar um, is a forest or woodland landowner. Well, with that, do Mike or, or Lynn, do you have anything else to add before we sign off for the evening? If they are looking for a forester, uh... Missouri Association of Consulting Foresters is a possibility, as well as their friendly Conservation Department foresters. Thank you. We also do have uh, some foresters who are Grow Native professional members, and you can go to grownative.org and to the resource guide and find them. Also, if you want to buy trees to enjoy or to potentially harvest one day for woodworking, you can purchase native trees from Grow Native professional members. And again, you can find them in the Grow Native uh, resource guide at grownative.org. Well, with that, thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, big thanks to both of you, Lynn and Mike for a wonderful presentation, really appreciate your time and expertise and sharing that with everybody today. Um, like I said, we'll get a, a, a link to a recording of the webinar out to you as soon as we can after today, along with some resources that Mike and Lynn mentioned. And we have another webinar coming up on June 8 on prairie orchids. So please join us for that. So thanks again, everyone, especially Mike and Lynn and everybody have a good evening. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.